give you an idea of the burden of heart failure, this affects 4.5% of Singapore's population. And of this, patients with heart failure, 60% of them have diabetes mellitus. And the age of onset is about 60 years old. That's about 10 years younger compared to our counterparts in North America and Europe. And the major risk factors will include that of prior myocardial infarction, as well as the presence of diabetes mellitus. And despite the use of evidence-based therapies, mortality remains high, with a mortality of up to 50% in five years. I will go through a clinical case. Mr. TTT is actually a 69-year-old gentleman with your usual hypertension, high cholesterol. He complains of some shortness of breath when he walks that has been worse over the past few months. He says that he has a non-productive cough usually occurs at night when he lies down in bed. He also has some weak swelling that has been there for the past two months or so. Of note, he is a smoker of 10 pack years. Examination-wise, you note know that he has saturation at room air of 96%. Auscultation reviews bi-basal crepitations, displays apex, as well as bilateral pedal edema. Medications that he's on for his cholesterol, as well as high blood pressure. Based on this initial impression, what will your differential diagnosis be? Some of the possible diagnosis will include that of heart failure, because this patient has had ankle swelling, displaced apex, bivasal crepitations. In view of his smoking history, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD should be kept in mind. RT can be considered because of the cough as well. Symptoms and signs of heart failure. This would be include shortness of breath when they walk, or top near. Patients usually come to you saying that they feel short of breath when they lie down in bed. It gets better when they use a pillow to pop themselves up, or they get cough when they lie down in bed. And this may be confused with post-nasal drip. They have reduced effort tolerance, as well as bilateral pedal edema. Auscultation, you can actually appreciate an uh, elevated JVP, displaced apex, or even cardiac murmurs. Some of the investigations that you can do in the primary care setting will include that of an ECG or check x ray, biomarkers such as BMP or antipo BMP. So, in this patient, the ECG actually shows that there's poor R wave progression in reads B2 to B4. You can see that. R, R waves are short. There's also LVH by voltage criteria. And the ring widths are low in QRS amplitude. They are very small QRS waves. This is what we mean by the Goldberger's stripe that confers 90% specificity for severe LV dysfunction. When you do the chest X-ray, you can realize that there may be pulmonary congestion, there can be bunting or costophrenic angles, of course, you also for any consolidation as well. One of the things you can do is actually a biomarker called anti-pro-BMP or BMP. So if you look at this diagnostic algorithm by the European Society of Cardiology, you can see that once you have clinical suspicion of heart failure, you can proceed to do an anti-pro-BMP. If it's normal, you are unlikely to have heart failure. But if it's elevated, you can proceed with echocardiography to diagnose heart failure. And the use of an anti pro BMP is routinely recommended in all newly diagnosed heart failure patients. And you can check on subsequent follow up to see whether there's any improvement in anti pro BMP after you have started the patient on medications. An anti pro BMP of more than 1,000 actually indicates an increased risk of death or hospitalization. Of course, please do bear in mind some of the non-cardiac causes of elevated anti pro BMP. And this could include things like anemia, chronic renal impairment, sleep apnea, hormonal hypertension, sepsis as well. With this in mind, you have the ECG, you have the chest X-ray, you have an elevated anti pro BMP. What can you do next? 
you can actually initiate oral diuretic or symptomatic relief while waiting for the patient to be seen by a cardiologist. And the cardiologist will usually do an echocardiogram to confirm the diagnosis of heart failure. These are some of the initial diagnostic tests recommended. You can see that most of these tests can be done in the primary care setting. Your biomarkers, your laboratory tests, the chest X-ray, your ECG. In the hospitals, you can do echocardiogram or coronary angiogram, cardiac MRI or biopsy for more detailed evaluation. So what do you look out for in echo? We look for any regional wall motion abnormalities, look at the wall thickness, look at the heart valves to suggest whether there is any valvular heart disease, the any evidence of pericarditis or hypertensive heart disease. So you can see that this is an echo of this patient. Just to orientate you, this the LV, this is the RV, this is the LA, this is the RA. And you can see the LV cavity in the two chamber view. There's poor contractibility. And this patient was reported to have an ejection fraction of 30 to 35%. So in short, this patient has a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as the EF is less than 40%. And how do you further optimize the medications? There are a lot of options available. So we go on to go-directed medical therapy. This is a 2021 expert consensus statement on the medications available for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. ACE, ARBs, ANIS, and beta blockers form the basis of treatment. Diuretic treatment agents can be added and titrated as required. In some patients, you can add on um, MRA such as spironolactone, or SGLT2 inhibitors such as dapagliflozin and paragliflozin, and this is has been shown to reduce mortality in patients. SGLT2 used to be a diabetic medicine, but it has been demonstrated in heart failure trials that it benefits non-diabetic patients with heart failure as well. In patients who cannot tolerate your MRAs, SGLT2 inhibitors, you can consider hydroxyl nitrate combination. Evapority is a good option to optimize heart rate for those in sinus rhythm of heart rate more than 70, despite optimization of beta blockers. It doesn't drop the blood pressure that much. If you look at recent trials, the Paradigm HF trial that studied Entresto versus Inalapil, that was standard of care prior to Anis or Entresto, demonstrated the use of Entresto or Anis actually resulted in a 20% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations. And the key value is significant with a number to treat of 21. So what the common question that we encounter is how do we switch from ACE or ARBs to Entresto? Entresto is essentially anise with valsartan. Nepulizing valsartan, valsartan combination. So in patients who are already on ACE inhibitors, do wait for a washout of 36 hours before you start them on ANIS. For those patients who are ARBs, you can transition them to ANIS without having to stop. Essentially, you start at lower doses and up titrate to the maximally tolerated dose sequentially. Similarly, we get very positive results from the SGLT2 inhibitors. In the DARPA HF and pro reduced trials, it showed that the use of SGLT2 agents actually reduced cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalizations, and urgent heart failure visits in heart failure patients, regardless of their diabetes status. And the number of treat is also 21, is small, 21. And the risk reduction is up to 25 to 26 percent. Well, things to take note is that always try to up titrate on medications. We don't usually start at the highest doses, but we see them on a regular basis to slowly up titrate the medications, wherever their blood pressure or renal function is tolerated.
So assuming that this patient started on all the medicine, he feels well, he's asymptomatic, but his blood pressure is on the border, I looks like S801 over 60. Um, the common question to us is whether we should cut down the medications and whether we should continue diuretics. If you look at this frank styling curve, you can realize that patients with advanced heart failure or poor heart function, they have a blunted frank styling curve. When you give them medications, it doesn't affect the blood pressure or cardiac output that much. So it can be continued in patients with borderline BP. What you should be aware of is actually alarm symptoms, essentially hypoperfusion symptoms, for instance, if they are cold, have cold peripheries, if they are not passing out good urine despite optimization of diuretics, if they are confused or they have symptoms of giddiness, these are things that may suggest the patient is not well perfused and they may benefit from a cardiologist review to see whether they will need inotropic agents. Let's assume that Mr. TTT returns to your clinic. He was recently initiated on sub subcubitral valsartan or entresto. He's covering quite well. He says that he has improved tremendously. He's in MYHA class one. You do the renal panel, you notice that the renal function actually worsened. Your creatinine of 80 went up to 120. Your potassium was 5.2. The question to ask is that whether should we stop the medication since it worsened the renal function? If you look at the European Society of Cardiology 2016 recommendations, you can actually expect an increase in creatinine of up to 50% above baseline, and you can tolerate an increase in potassium of less than 5.5. Of course, do consider monitoring them at regular intervals. Subsequently, after six months of treatment, you, the cardiologist decided to repeat an echocardiogram. It showed that the ejection fracture actually recovered from a baseline of 30 to 35% to a normal ejection fraction of 60% is coming well. The question we get asked very frequently is, doctor, can I start, stop the medications? What will your answer be? If you look at the TRAC-HF trial, whereby they study a phase therapy withdrawal of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy with recovered ejection fraction to more than 50% in NYHA class one, and anti-pro BNP of less than 250, you know that up to 46% of these patients would have a relapse, which means their heart failure worsened or their ejection fraction worsened in six months after they stop the medications. So the take home message is that try not to stop the medications. You can down titrate the diuretics, but the patient most probably requires some ACE or ARMIs or beta blockers as a maintenance therapy. When do you refer to an advanced heart failure therapy or other specialists? This is best summarized by I need help. I stands for requiring IV inotropes, need N for New York Heart Association class 3 to 4, N organ dysfunction, ejection fracture less than 35%, defibrillatory shocks, recurrent hospitalization, pedal edema despite optimization of diuretics a low blood pressure, high heart rate, and inability to tolerate medications whereby your down titrate because the blood pressure is just too low. At the Heart Center Singapore, we do have a multidisciplinary team to look after them. Device therapy such as ICD or CRTD can be considered in some group of patients to prevent sudden cardiac death. We look at the clinical cause of heart failure, when patients are diagnosed, they are generally quite okay. They get repeated hospitalization after a few years or months, and subsequently, they go into pump failure. And this is when you decide whether this patient is a candidate for advanced heart failure therapies or palliative care. Transplant is not the solution. In Singapore, you get 10 to 15 transplants a year, and that's insufficient to cope with the burden of heart failure. So in place, we have mechanical circulatory devices such as ventricular assist device. This is actually a very small device that's implanted 
to the LV cavity that goes to the aorta. And what this pump does is to augment the cardiac output, which this can be used as a bridge to transplant, to recovery, or as a destination therapy for older patients. In patients who do not qualify for advanced mechanical circulatory support, they can be referred to a palliative or supportive care team who will help to minimize the symptoms or discomfort they experience. So in conclusion, we touched about diagnosing heart failure in the community using biomarkers, ECG and chest x-ray, how we initiate and up titrate medications, and it's advisable to continue medications despite recovery. And this summarizes the building blocks of therapy for patients with heart failure rejection, reduced ejection fraction. At the base of foundation, you will see beta blockers, ACE or ARMIs, SGLT2 inhibitors, MRAs. In some patients, they may benefit from digoxin, erubidin if their heart rate is high, and sinus rhythm, despite optimization of beta blockers. Hydrolyzing nitrate combination for some patients who cannot tolerate your usual ACE, MRAs, or SGLT2 to the poor renal function. Intravenous iron has been shown to reduce hospitalization for heart failure as well as symptoms. However, this only applies to the intravenous form. Oral iron replacement has not been demonstrated to be useful. At the tip of the pyramid, you'll see things like a ventricular assist device and a very select few patients will benefit from cardiac transplant. With that, I thank you for your attention.